Could Eric Armstead be on his way to Buffalo? Running back Ty Johnson is back. Compensatory pick bingo is in full effect. We got another bill heading to Miami. Brandon Bean's to-do list, folks. We've got plenty to get to here today on Locked on Bills. You are locked on Bills. Your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout-out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Well, folks, welcome in. We got some things to reflect on today. I do want to address a rumor surrounding the Buffalo Bills. That'll be our lead story. And then we'll talk about Ty Johnson coming back to the Bills. Dane Jackson got himself one heck of an opportunity with the Carolina Panthers. I want to focus in on the need at safety. The compensatory pick possibility is shaping up really well for 2025. And of course, that to-do list that I have for Brandon Bean. I want to see how that is shaping up. But I do want to start with a rumor, and folks, I don't normally do this. You don't normally listen to this podcast and catch me talking about rumors. But there's been a couple of different sources that have indicated that the Buffalo Bills have some interest in free agent defensive tackle Eric Armstead. Eric Armstead was recently released by the San Francisco 49ers, was a first-round pick of theirs a number of years ago, has been a really outstanding defensive lineman in the NFL. And San Francisco let him go. They created a bunch of cap space. And the 49ers are one of those teams that really, they're they're willing to reset quite a bit with their personnel. And so we have two different sources here. Matt Barrows of The Athletic said to keep an eye on Buffalo as a potential landing spot. And then Aaron Wilson of NBC Houston, who's regarded pretty highly as an NFL insider. He's got a lot of contract details. He breaks some news. He mentioned that the Bills have some interest. And then, of course, you connect the dots even further, and Eric Armstead's wife is from Hornell, a UB grad. And you start to wonder, is this really going to happen? Now, look, I don't know how the money would work out for the Buffalo Bills because I don't actually know what their salary cap position is right now. I feel like there are so many loose ends between the reality of the Dawson Knox reworked contract, how some of the new additions are hitting the books, how much money was saved by extending Deion Dawkins. I just feel like we have a lot to figure out about where the bills are cap wise, but I don't assume that they're brimming with cap space. And I would think that Eric Armstead would be a guy that commands a contract of around $15 million a season, pretty expensive player. This is no small addition. This would be, this would be a notable addition. Now, there's some complicating factors with Eric Armstead. So I get excited because Eric Armstead's a certified dude on the defensive line. But that doesn't mean he doesn't come with some questions. I mean, he's entering his age 30 season right now. He'll turn 31, I think, in November. In 2022, he missed eight games with a fractured left ankle. In 2023, he missed five games. He played through a knee injury, a torn meniscus that he has to have surgery on, and and it's most likely going to keep him out of almost all of the off-season activities. 
So an aging player with the last two seasons being problematic for injuries. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to be injured for the rest of his career, right? And, and for a player like him, I don't think he's going to age poorly. He's 6'7", 290 pounds, stylistically quite similar to like a Calais Campbell, who is well into his late 30s. I think he's like 38 years old, just had a great season for the Falcons. So I, I'm less concerned about the age as I am the combination of a little bit of age here in the last two seasons, missing a fair amount of time with some notable injuries. And, and look, you're now coming off of a meniscus repair, which we saw happen with Jalen Ramsey, right? Jalen Ramsey with the Dolphins had that meniscus injury during camp, returned like midway through the season, and he played really well. And he's a defensive back, and you would think, a position like defensive back requires even more athleticism than a defensive lineman. So like, there's definitely a path forward here and Jalen Ramsey's no spring chicken either. So I, I feel somewhat good about this, but also I, I recognize some of the concerns, but Eric Armstead, six, seven, 290 pounds, a certified dude on the defensive line, line, long arms, physical, disruptive player. He can rush. He can squeeze gaps. He'd be a heck of an addition for any team. And, of course, the, the Buffalo Bills as well. And I know that you have Ed Oliver and Daquan Jones as more of your interior players. But I still, like I've been talking about, you have a lot of snaps. And I think, actually, maybe the presence of Ed Oliver and Daquan Jones makes this even more logical for Eric Armstead, who might be a little slow to start the season as he's coming back from that meniscus injury. I honestly I think he'd probably be fine. He would missing most of the offseason activities doesn't mean week one, right? Like he would get to camp and I would I would guess he'd be fine to go for week one. But as an aging player, you know, I feel like maybe fitting into this rotation would be a good move. But there also might have to be some concessions for Eric Armstead. And if part of the motivation here is that he's going back to Western New York where his wife has roots and that's playing into it, well, you know, it could be a situation where he's willing to make some concessions to kind of get the scenario that he wants. I think for guys later into their careers, that stuff becomes very important. You heard Daquan Jones talk about that in his uh, press conference after he signed his contract extension. He talked about some of the opportunities that existed out there, but he's like, man, I got a house here. My kids are in school. You're going to uproot that to, to go live in another city. Like you got to remember these are real people. And so for maybe for Eric Armstead, as he's winding down in his career, he gets to play for a contender in the bills. Obviously maybe there's some truth to his wife wanting to get back to the area. And that becomes a, an important factor for him in his decision-making. And I'm sure Brandon Bean's going to be quite candid with his agent and say, look, we, we don't have a ton of cap space. We'd love to have him. But if he wants every dollar he can get, then he's probably going to have to go play for some other team. So we'll see. Stay tuned on this. If the Bills get him, I'll probably be very excited because of the type of player Eric Armstead is. If the Bills don't get him, I'll tell myself, well, he's aging with some injury concerns. And the Bills weren't really in position to make a splash like this. They splash like this. They need to kind of stick with their plan. So that's my thoughts on Eric Armstead and how I plan on processing things moving forward on that front. All right. Ty Johnson set to return to the Bills. Dane Jackson to the Carolina Panthers. The Bills are likely to get a compensatory pick in 2025, maybe multiple. We're going to get to all of that here in just a moment. So be sure to stick with me. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, a no cap on that 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. 
Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to sub- subject uh, to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA is available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker-dealer. All right, folks, Ty Johnson set to return to the Buffalo Bills, according to Jeremy Fowler. And Jeremy Fowler gets a lot of good scoops on the Buffalo Bills. If he says something and it's related to the Bills, you know that's probably true. So he is reporting that the Bills intend to re-sign Ty Johnson. Don't have the terms of the deal. You would expect that to be a minimum type contract. Now, this is a deal that I'm I'm happy about. I'm really happy to have Ty Johnson back. And I know from a lot of the conversations that I have with Bills Mafia that you are too, through the subtext community, through social media. I know that there's a lot of happiness to bring Ty Johnson back. Uh, 26 years old, five years of NFL experience. And I'm not exactly sure why he hasn't latched on anywhere. But he's a a nice addition to a football team. He gives you some size, right? He's not like a small running back, 210, 215 pounds. Has speed, like legit low 4-4 speed. You saw that that one touchdown catch that he caught out in the the flats last year and just housed it like nobody could catch up to him. He's got legit speed. I can catch the football. He's a physical, competitive runner. You could tell, right? You watched him play football last year. You saw the physicality and the competitive toughness that he runs with. And also, he gives you special teams ability, not only as a kick returner, but he can cover kicks and punts as well. A very, very, very useful player. And so I'm I'm certainly very happy to see him back in the mix. The question that I have is, where does he fall on this depth chart? It's interesting because the Bills right now only have two running backs under contract, James Cook and now Ty Johnson. That's it. That's the whole list of running backs the Bills have under contract. So we know that more moves are coming. They have to fill out this running back room. There's going to be at least three or four more players added at running back, whether that's draft picks, more free agents, undrafted free agents. There's going to be some opportunity here. Is Ty Johnson the RB2 or is Ty Johnson the RB3? That's what's fascinating to me. Because I think the Bills do have a need for another back here. Like, obviously. You know that I've been kind of fascinated with the idea of adding a Zeke Elliott-type player that can run the ball between the tackles, that can serve in short yardage, right, in goal line situations, that can pass protect. Those are some very important characteristics to me about what's missing from this running back room. And I think you get some of that with Ty Johnson, but you need another player here. I mean, can you be one snap away from Ty Johnson being your lead running back and then his backup being some fifth or sixth round pick? I mean, kind of interested to see how this all shakes out, but very happy that Ty Johnson's back in the mix as part of this running back room to go with James Cook. Dane Jackson got himself a heck of a deal. Dane Jackson, a Carolina Panther, signed a two-year, $8.5 million contract that has some incentives baked in that can push it to like a a max value of around 12 million bucks. Dude got a good deal for him. Happy for him as a guy that was like, was he a sixth or seventh round pick? He actually got cut at at one point. Signed to the practice squad, back on the roster, was a restricted free agent at one point. And having never been a preferred starter, to put himself in this position now where he gets paid pretty well, You can't help but be happy for him. Certainly a lot more than I expected. Certainly a lot more, especially last year when he was a restricted free agent, and then he winds up coming back for, like I think, less than what the restricted free agent tender was. It was kind of surprising. Obviously, the Carolina Panthers see some appeal here. I mean, Dan Morgan used to be part of the Bills' front office that certainly knows Dane Jackson, and you hear the way that the coaching staff talks about Dane Jackson as a pro's pro and all that. I mean, good for him, but I thought maybe, just maybe there was a chance that he comes back as like 
the the CB four. So I think of I think of Dane Jackson as an outstanding third cornerback, a fringe CB two. He's going to get a chance to start in Carolina. They just traded away Dante Jackson. They have J.C. Horn. Uh, I think he's going to be the starter opposite of J.C. Horn. And Ajiro Avero, very good young defensive coordinator that has had some head coaching looks, you know, have a great opportunity to work with Dane Jackson. Now, the Bills, on the other side of this, do have a need at corner. I think their top three are really good. I love Christian Benford. I love Rasul Douglas. And I really like Kyer Elam as a CB3 with some developmental appeal. I mean, there's a potentially a path that maybe next year it's Benford and Elam as the Bills starting corners. So we'll see how it all shakes out. I think for this year, you definitely have Douglas factored in as one of those starters, but you you need a fourth corner. And the Bills have used a lot of corners throughout the last three years as, as seemingly all of these guys have had some injuries at one point or another. There was some speculation late on uh, Wednesday night. I think Levi Wallace, who's a free agent, former Buffalo Bill, spent the last two years with the Pittsburgh Steelers, kind of put an Instagram post out there that, you know, it was like, I heard you missed me or something and taking a picture in Steelers gear in front of a Bills logo when he, I think when he played uh, in Buffalo during the playoffs last year. I think Levi Wallace would be a, a good idea for some reasons. I mean, obviously familiarity, that would be helpful and um, can can play in this scheme. We know that he, he's played his best football in Buffalo. But as your CB4, he doesn't really give you any special teams value. So that's kind of the trade-off there. You get a, a nice player defensively, but it's, I mean, Levi Wallace hasn't really played a lick of special teams in the NFL. Maybe a few snaps like on the field goal block team, which is more or less, we're just keeping our defense on the field. So that would be a trade-off there. I think ideally your CB4 gives you that special teams ability like a Dane Jackson. But Dane Jackson, a, a now fairly handsomely played player by the Carolina Panthers. One thing I do want to mention as we're kind of talking about safeties or we're talking about defensive backs and kind of what the Bills need there, and I talked about what the Bills need in that CB4. You know, we're still looking at a pretty big hole here at safety uh, for the Bills needing a guy to play alongside Taylor Rapp, who is one of the presumed starters. I think it's important that they get a particular skill set. Now, there's plenty of players out there that I like. I am nowhere near panicking about a safety. I promise you that. I'm not panicking. But I do think it's it's fair now that you kind of identify Taylor Rapp as one of the starters to realize what you need in that other player. And I think the Bills are going to play a lot of split zone coverage, a lot of quarters, a lot of cover two. But when they want to play in non-split zone coverages where you have one deep safety, you need a guy with some range. And so that's an important trait to me. I've gotten some questions through the subtext community about you know, is, is Taylor Rapp kind of a Jordan Poyer replacement and then they really need that Micah Hyde player? Well, yeah, they do. So a guy with range and ball skills is what I'm looking for that has that ability to cover some deep zones. Candidly, that's why I wasn't really into Jeremy Chin. I was very lukewarm on that idea. He signs with the Washington Commanders, and I think for the Commanders, Jeremy Chin's really just going to be a linebacker. Do you remember Marquise Bell? for the the Cowboys and that game the Bills played against them. And Dan Quinn, that defensive coordinator, who's now the head coach of the Washington Commanders, he plays Marquise Bell, who's really a safety as a linebacker. I think that's what Jeremy Chin's going to do for the Commanders. He's not going to be a deep free safety for the Buffalo Bills. I was never really in on that idea uh, because I don't think he really fit that, I, that, that type of role that the Bills need. But well, as we're thinking about this needed safety, let's be thinking about range, deep zone, defense ability, ball skills. Ashton Davis fits that for me in a big way. John Johnson, Julian Blackman, Jordan Fuller, Mike Edwards, Eddie Jackson is exactly that. Quandre Diggs is out there if the Bills wanted to pay a little bit more. If they wanted to make a big splash at safety, Justin Simmons is out there who would be the perfect, exactly what I'm talking about, playmaking, deep zone defender, ball skills. So plenty of options out there at safety, uh, but I do think that we have to calibrate ourselves. Like, don't be disappointed if the Bills didn't get Jeremy Chin. That wouldn't have really made a lot of sense. Those aren't the type of safeties that I think the Bills need. It's more this other type. And so I wanted to give you some names to consider on that front. All right, folks, the Bills are actually in good shape to get multiple compensatory picks in 2025. So I want to talk about that. Saran Neal to the Dolphins. We got some number changes and the rest of Brandon Bean's to-do list. Folks, stick with me. We'll be right back. You shouldn't have to worry 
when you're looking to buy tickets for your next big event, well, you don't have to because game time is here for you. And it's the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. They've got killer deals on last minute tickets, all in prices. They give you a view from your seat and a best price guarantee. I mean, game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. The app is awesome. Super easy to navigate. They have flash deals. And I also love this. Whenever you buy a ticket from game time, they send it straight to your phone. So you don't have to dig through emails to find it. It's very, very simple. So snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account and redeem code locked on for $20 off. That's L O C K E D O N. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guarantee. All right, folks. Compensatory picks. I want to talk about this a little bit. And I know that this is a bit of a sore subject because we talked about compensatory picks last year. And then the Bills. We're supposed to get a third round pick. They got a fourth round pick. I get it. We're all a little sour when it comes to these compensatory picks. But let's talk about it anyways, because the Bills are in position to get some. So the way that compensatory picks work is it's a formula that accounts for the free agents that you sign versus the free agents that you lose. And you want a net loss in free agents. And then if you have that, you'll get compensatory picks. And you can have a maximum of four compensatory picks per team. And so the Bills, like I mentioned here, are very much in position to land some 2025 compensatory picks because they have lost three free agents that qualify, Gabe Davis, Leonard Floyd, and Dane Jackson. So Dane Jackson getting an average annual salary a $4.25 million puts him on the board for the Bills to be able to get a compensatory pick. So right now they're in line to get a fourth round pick for losing Gabe Davis, a fifth round pick for losing Leonard Floyd, and a sixth round pick for losing Dane Jackson. Meanwhile, they have gained zero free agents that qualify against the net loss. So they've signed Nicholas Moreau and Matt Collins, neither count in the equation. So this is shaping up pretty good, not to mention there's a couple more players that the Bills could lose and Tyrell Dotson and Tim Settle that might get a big enough deal that puts them on the board to help you get a compensatory pick. So we'll see how this all plays out. If you sign players that were cut from another team, that doesn't count. So like the Bills lost Jordan Poyer and Mitch Morse, but it doesn't count because they cut those players. It has to be an expiring contract in versus an expiring contract out. And then, you know, based on the APY, and then there's some performance things. There's, there's, there's a lot to it, but as of now, this is shaping up quite well for the bills at this point in time, have an extra fourth, fifth and sixth round pick in 2025 based on, you know, the people that project this stuff over at over the cap, they usually typically do a very good job of it. Something to keep in mind. And then for Tyrell Dotson and Tim settle, Root for them to get all the money out there on the free agent market. All right, Saran Neal is a Miami Dolphin, signs a one-year deal with the Dolphins. Um, thought it's just at least interesting to mention as another Bill heads to Miami to obviously Jordan Poyer there, now Saran Neal. Saran Neal's been a Buffalo Bill since 2018, and so you know he'll have plenty of intel to share. Obviously, he's going there to play special teams, which have been a real issue for Miami for a number of years, like multiple seasons in a row with some, some real blunders on special teams. And, you know, part of what's interesting about their approach with special teams is they haven't really uh, been as deliberate as the bills about having players that literally exist for special teams. They will cross pollinate a little, a little bit too much where some of the guys that are their core special teamers also have to play offense or defense. And that really kind of takes away from their ability on special teams. And so maybe this is a shift for them uh, philosophically to have more specific special teams players because their special teams units, have really been pretty miserable throughout the last several years. And they get potentially a good one in Saran Neal. I do feel like, as we talked about in the performance review, uh, that the the impact on special teams ha- did diminish this past year, um, which, is, which is pretty disappointing because he was a handsomely paid special teams player. So we'll see what he does in Miami, but I at least wanted to point that out. One other little nugget here is the, the Bills had a few players uh, switch numbers. 
um, Kyer Elam and Mitchell Trubisky. So Mitchell Trubisky is going to come in and wear number 11. Last time that he was with the Bills, he wore 10. Uh, but that's Khalil Shakir now. We're not messing with that. That's Khalil Shakir's number, number 10. So Mitch Trubisky wearing number 11. And I don't know if you're like me, but every time I see a Bill in number 11, to me, it's always Roscoe Parrish. And I know that Mitchell Trubisky and Roscoe Parrish couldn't be more different, but I always associate the number 11 with the Bills with Roscoe Parrish. And the other one for me is 24. 24 for me is always Terrence McGee. Like every player that wears 24 is Terrence McGee. I don't know if you guys, I think I've said this on the podcast before, but there's like a couple of numbers for me that's just always, always that player, you know, and those are them for me. Uh, Kyrie Elam is switching to number five. That's the number he wore in college. So it can't hurt. You know, I know that at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, like the number that you wear. But I think for these players, things like this could be important to them. And, you know, I think a switch like that could be helpful, right? It can't hurt. Goes back to his college number. And I'm I'm curious to see what happens here with Kyrie Elam now that John Butler's gone. And we know that that relationship didn't seem to be very good. Uh, now that Tredavious is what Tredavious White's gone, Dane Jackson's gone. He's going to be the CB three, presumably. You know, a great opportunity here for Kyer Elam, who's the second youngest player on the roster, entering his third season. But he's the second player on the roster. I've uh, tried to say that as many times as I could here on this podcast this off season. All right, let's uh, before we close out of here, let's check in on Brandon Bean's to-do list. And so we'll just go top to bottom. Still think he needs that wide receiver addition. Um, I'm thinking that it's probably a first or a second round pick. They, I know they added some depth in Mac Hollins, but they still need that. They still need that, that uh, building block, if you will, at wide receiver. And that's the way I'll phrase it. Starting defensive end. I think they got that in AJ Epinesa starting one tech in Daquan Jones, one starting safety in Taylor Rapp. They need another starting safety. We talked about that already. They need defensive tackle depth. If you ask me what I'm concerned about the most right now, it's defensive tackle depth because you have a lot of snaps behind Ed Oliver and Daquan Jones to fill in. And um, you need to get some guys that can come in and make an impact in a in a part-time role. Same thing at defensive end. I still think you need another defensive end. I just think you need another running back that's going to be rostered. Like you have two running backs under under control right now. You're going to roster at least a third one. So you need to find that guy. You need a punt returner. That has to happen. You got your backup quarterback in Mitchell Trubisky. You got one backup running back in Ty Johnson. You got some good wide receiver depth in Mac Hollins. You need interior offensive line depth. I would love to see the Bills go out and get a Brian Allen or a Sua Opeta. Like, I think you need to get a meaningful interior offensive line reserve. And preferably be a guy that has some experience at center. That's why I'm really in on Brian Allen. If there's some value with Brian Allen, please send him to the Buffalo Bills because not only do you get a hedge against Connor McGovern shifting to center, but you have a guy that is an experienced starter with Aaron Cromer. It just feels like a match made in heaven, so would love to see Brian Allen come to the Buffalo Bills. I would love to see some meaningful tackle depth in competition, just like I talked about with like Nicholas Morrow coming in and – because Dorian Williams shouldn't be the assumed LB3, or Justin Shorter will benefit from having a guy like Mike, Matt Collins, Ryan Vandemark should not be the assumed swing tackle, like in any way, shape, or form. I would, you've heard me hype up Ryan Vandemark for like a while now, but competition, man, he's got to go earn it. So I definitely make sure that he has some meaningful competition. I don't know if the Bills look at Tommy Doyle as that, but. I'd, I'd be interested in some meaningful competition for Ryan Vandemark in addition to Alec Anderson. Um, you got safety depth in Cam Lewis. You got linebacker depth in Nicholas Morrow. And you need cornerback depth, which we talked about. Potentially, that's Levi Wallace. But again, my, my concern with Levi Wallace is that there's really no special teams upside whatsoever. So there you have it, folks. We covered a lot of different things here on today's episode. And whatever comes through next, we'll talk about it on our next conversation here. So you never know when the moves are going to come uh, for the Buffalo Bills and free agency. So head on a swivel per usual and anything that goes down, we'll talk about in our next conversation. So don't miss it. Make sure that you're subscribed. We'd love it. If you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast, have a great rest of your day. Go Bills. And I look forward to catching up with you again real soon.